how you come down. Another day alive. Another day alive. Go figure. Who'd have thunk? I honestly did not think there was a chance in hell I would have lived this long. <laughs> to be honest. I was always positive I was going to be dead early for a long time. I still wouldn't be surprised if it happened anytime soon, but whatever. Each day is a gift, right? Now, Brain's going blank again. What I was going to mention. So I had a two-hour conversation with our friend Darren Clark. He's had experiences fairly often, which he, he said flat out in his video. We put on the membership only so we can keep the the uh, food shopping going for the children here. Sure. Speak the devil. Sarah's doing her next shop tomorrow. Sunday tomorrow? Yeah, she has surgery on Tuesday, and she wants to get that this week's shop done on Sunday, and then she'll probably go get the food to the other new kids on Monday. So anyway, so uh, Darren agreed we're going to slam his uh, conversation with I, myself, and him on the uh, membership slot of this channel, all right? And anyway, so he still persists in going to his hunting and fishing spots. He's got a cabin not too far from here. And it's in an area that I just don't feel comfortable hanging out in by myself. I mean, I would go there. I'll go there. He wants me to go fishing. We'll probably go there. But it's not big on my list of places to go. Only because of the feeling I've had when around there. And I know um, what's going on around there more often than not. And I seem to find my own places where I like to get away and go fishing, where it just seems okay and I'm being left alone so far. But anyway, uh, he went, yesterday he went to a place where he's had, he's left abruptly, terrified, but he still goes back. And he, <clears throat> he shares the pictures yesterday of some big alder trees snapped in half, big green alder trees. So I'll share those photos right now. And uh, if you know Vancouver Island and snow load, it might snow here and stay maybe maybe three days tops. It doesn't snow. Snow didn't bust those trees in half. No way. But anyway, <laughs> he looks a little concerned in the pictures. Probably because he doesn't need to... Uh... He said flat out, if he could give all of experience, his, his experiences away, paid, have them erased, he would. He wishes that he didn't have those experiences. Anyway, that's those photos. Now. Man, I just turned that heater off. I cannot stand those background sounds. Where would my glasses go? <clears throat> okay. All right. Here we go. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. This is titled Sasquatches of Vancouver Island Part 2. Well, it was 2010, the last day of hunting season. Me and my buddy were our bow hunters. And we were hunting in the Nanus Bay area on 100 acres of big timber. I was kind of excited that day because I just got myself a new bow. And it was a Browning Illusion compound bow. 330 feet per second. Pretty good for those pretty good for these for those days those days I had my tree stand in beside a big swamp and big timber well I got my tree stand in the evening probably two hours before dark I sat for a while and just pretty quiet nothing moving and then the distance I can hear it sounded like footsteps big footsteps 
I thought it was just a big bear coming my way. So I sat there listening. As this thing came closer, I could tell it was on two legs. I was starting to get pretty scared. Let me tell you, Steve. This thing walked in at about 30 yards away. I'm trying to get a look at this thing, and I'm moving around, and I'm looking, and I could see part of the right side of the chest. It was totally black, and this thing was big. It was on two legs, and it had to be eight feet tall. I could see, like I said, part of the chest, and I knew it was no bear, and I just totally lost it. Somehow, I think it just knew I was there, because it, it didn't give me, just because it didn't give me direct, you know, I couldn't see it perfectly. It stayed there for a few minutes, moving around, and then it started walking off, and it was so loud, it was crazy. I was absolutely terrified. I took my $1,200 bow that I just bought and threw it out of the tree and jumped down, almost broke my ankle as I was terrified. I ran out to the old cut road. I'm at my buddy's. Never said a word to him all the way home. Okay, he's a few typos here, so I guess he meant he met up with his buddy and I never said a word to him all the way home. I said, we got to go. And I just started walking towards the truck. It was already getting dark at that time. Anyway, as soon as I got home, I called my uncle, Rennie, mountain man. I told him what happened. And in the morning, he was there at 7. So we went looking for tracks. And within 15 to 20 minutes, my uncle found a set of tracks. Two tracks exactly. But it was raining heavy and they were covered with water. So I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a plaster Paris track. You know what I mean? The two tracks are about... Five to five, five to five feet apart in a straight line. I did do a video recording on the old video camera, and now I don't have those pictures anymore. As we were looking for more evidence, my uncle said, we'll just go up this gully. So as we were hiking up the gully, we almost got to the top, and we heard the deepest growling you've ever heard. I turned and ran, and as I started to run, my uncle grabbed me and said, no. Lee, and I was terrified. I basically begged my uncle if we could leave because I just couldn't handle it. I was just too much of a wimp and I was just too scared. I'm not like him. Well, thank you for reading my story, Steve, and I have a lot more of them. You can use my name, Leon Poirier. Poirier? This part is just for you. Okay, I got you, man. All right. Well, if you, I'd imagine it was a recent email, so uh, we'll see about possibly getting you together with me if you want. If you want to do a video with me, and we'll talk about it, and you can share with the people what you got. I'm all over it. All right. You're not too far away from me. And there you go. Back around again. Growling again. Eight feet tall again. This next one's titled, I'm Not Sure Bigfoot Was Involved. Hi, Steve. Thank you for creating a site for us to document our experiences. I've learned so much in the three years I've been watching your channel. Please call me Chris. In the past couple of months, I have heard several experiences that made me think I may have had an encounter. First, I need to preface that I don't panic. I have a job that requires me to stay calm. So my reaction in this case is very unusual for me. In the early eight, 1980s, I often would walk the trails in the Kettle Moraine State Forest. I went early in the day to avoid humans, and this day I grabbed my day pack and started to hike. I had two containers of water and two apples. The day was beautiful. Dappled sunlight, birds singing, bugs zipping by, and I hiked for about 40 to 45 minutes. I suddenly was aware that it was totally quiet. It was never that quiet in these woods. I kept walking for another 10 to 15 minutes, and I started to get creeped out. I felt like there was a bad guy just around the next bend. I couldn't ignore the feeling and decided to end my walk. I spun around and immediately tripped over an exposed root. Down I went. I looked around, preparing to, I looked around, preparing to be embarrassed, but there was no one to see. I started to get up and found that I had messed my knee up. I finally got up and started walking. My knee really hurt bad. I started to feel panic building in my chest, and I knew I had to get out of there. 
I walked about 100 yards and had to rest my knee. The panic was building. I started talking to myself to just keep going. The panic was overwhelming. It was overwhelming me. I sat on a boulder next to the trail. Tears started to form. I could only hear my breathing and me saying I'm trying to leave. The next thing you know, I'm laying on the hood of my car. Note, I don't sit on car hoods. Needless to say, I was in a bit of shock. I moved to the side of the car and slid down, landing on my good leg. My day pack was on the ground, opened. The two apples were gone. Not thinking, I took a regular step to my car door. No pain in my knee. I tested again, no pain. I went home. All of these years, I thought I went into some kind of fog from the panic. Now I'm not so sure. I had seen the Patty video, but Bigfoot never crossed my mind. I'll never know for sure. But I thought I'd just put it out there. Thank you, Steve and the club. There's a holy shit story. <laughs> a lot of people have had that happen in the woods, right? Edgar, scientist, had it happen. Showing up farther down the trail. Losing time. Um, our friend Kelly Dan's friends in Mount Curry. He had his buddy who was walking ahead of the group down the trail. And all of a sudden, he was, what, on the ground? On the same trail, but the group was now ahead of him. What else? I've had a lot of people getting dis discombobulated in the, in the timber, not knowing where they are, where they've been a million times. And then uh, all of a sudden showing up somewhere else. That's pretty alarming, right? It's pretty alarming. That's quite a crazy experience. And of course, you can't just automatically, like I said, the writer just said, uh, saw the Patterson Gimlin film, but never thought of Bigfoot. I mean, who would, right? You're feeling terrified. You don't know shit about this topic. Feeling terrified, something bad's there. Next thing you know, you wake up in the hood of your car and your backpack's open and Apple's gone. Right? And if that's all you experience, you're not going to automatically go, huh, I bet it was a nine foot tall, hairy, naked guy. You know what I mean? It's like my knife thing. You gotta keep them coming. You gotta keep these experiences coming no matter what. Somebody is relating to what this person just wrote in. Somebody is. Guaranteed. Somewhere. And now they probably just had a aha uh -huh moment. And they're thinking about sharing it openly. crazy. Wanted a sighting, but didn't want the terror is the title of this email. Hello, Steve. My name is Michael Todd. I'm 58 years old and I live in Pennsylvania. I'm a believe I have been a believer of Sasquatch most of my life, probably since I saw the Patterson film, which I can't recall how long ago that was. And my story started about 2019. When my brother asked me and my brother-in-law if we wanted to play cards with him and a friend at the hunting camp he belonged to, we said yes. We played cards till around 1 a.m. and decided to go to bed. Now everyone else is going to sleep upstairs where the beds were, but I decided to sleep down on a couch in the living room because the camp was heated with a wood stove and I grew up with a lot of bad f flu fires when I was a kid and knew I wouldn't be able to sleep if I wasn't downstairs to watch the stoves. I can sleep all night without having to get up to go to the bathroom, but all three of the other guys were getting up to go outside to pee. And after the last one went out and came back in, I lay there for about 10 minutes and thought, what the heck, might as well go out and piss. So I did. When I got outside, I realized it was very quiet night. The only thing I could hear was a dog barking in the distance. Then... I'm not really sure if it had been going on the whole time because I didn't hear it, but I could hear these very long howls coming from an area about a half mile away. And they sounded like they were around where a small hollow ran up the mountain. This hollow runs from the main road up to the top of the mountain. The howls are about 15 to 20 seconds long. And as soon as one would end, another one would start and you could hear them echo all the way through the valley. They were very long and loud. They sounded just like the Ohio howls, only longer and louder. 
I'm not sure how long I listened to them, but I realized that I'm standing out there by myself and started to get a little frightened. So I went back in and I didn't say anything to the other guys. As usual, right? Isn't that weird? But I did tell a friend I worked with and he offered to go along with me for a little scouting trip and see if we could find anything that might give me an idea of what I heard. Now, I've been a hunter and a fisherman all my life. I've been in a climbing stand for an hour to an hour and a half before daylight, and I've never heard anything close to what I heard that night. It was two weeks after I heard the howls that we decided to go see if we could find anything that would give me an idea of what I heard. It was February, so there was a couple of inches of snow on the ground, and I thought that was going to be our best chance to find something. Just to give you an idea of the area, there are fenced in apple orchards on both sides of the camp, and when we drove up to do our scouting, we drove past the camp, and on the other side of the orchard is a large parking area where the game commission had planted a large plot of pine trees. It's pretty open in the plot of pines, so I thought it wouldn't be hard to see some tracks, so we went for a walk down through them. The howls came from the opposite side of the road, but I figured that we might catch something quick. I saw a lot of deer tracks, one set of bear tracks. And being a hunter, I figured the animals would feed more towards the apple orchard, and I was right, because we found a large area where the deer had the leaves and snow all scraped away where they'd been feeding. We looked all around that area, and I found what looked like a track. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I couldn't say for sure. It was. Sorry, I couldn't say for sure it was. So we walked back to my truck and crossed the road. The further we walked, the thicker it got. So I looked for a deer trail and found one. They went up and to the north, towards where the howls came from. Once we made it up to where the mountain laurel started and got very thick, we started walking straight north, <clears throat> excuse me, and looking for tracks. And we proceeded about 100 yards, and we were directly across from the camp, and I started to walk toward the road when I saw a bare spot, about two feet in diameter, with snow all around it. And what I thought was definitely a track. It was about 20 inches long and 7 to 8 inches wide. I'm going to try to send the picture of the track. And in the picture, my buddy placed his boot heel to heel with the track. And his boot was 12 inches long. That was all that we could find on that trip. Later on that year, my brother asked me if I wanted to become a member of the, of the camp. And I said, absolutely. After I'd become a member, I spent a, a lot of time scouting the area around the camp most of which was state forest land. Now, most of the members of the camp were from out of state. So when I was there, I was by myself, not knowing what I had heard that morning. Not knowing what I had heard that one morning in February, I had a little bit of worry going out with no one else around. So I carried my 45 in my backpack to give me a little comfort. Now, this is illegal in PA during archery season, but after what I had already had on my mind, I took my chances. <laughs> yeah, right? Who wouldn't? Screw those rules. I mainly hunt with a bow, and there wasn't anyone else there during the first month and a half of the season. I mainly stayed within 400 yards or so of the camp that first year, for obvious reasons, until I got to meet the rest of the guys, and I had a better idea of where they hunted, because I'm the kind of guy that doesn't want to mess up an area someone else has been hunting for years. I never had anything happen once I, became a, once I became a member, and in the following three years, I had nothing happen. In 2022, I hunted, up, I hunted up at camp for the first month of archery season. I wasn't seeing much of anything, so a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to hunt the hill behind their house, and I said, sure. Well, I ended up missing a nice buck. Then the second time I went out, and four days later, I killed a decent eight point. I still had a doe tag when rifle season came around, Excuse me, and I really didn't care if I killed another deer because my wife doesn't eat venison. Yeah, I know. But I love being in my stand, so I was hunting with my bow because I would rather kill them with archery equipment. I hunted till 9, 30, 10 o'clock that morning. I didn't kill anything. But after I got out of the stand, I walked up to my buddy's house, and their son-in-law was looking for help getting a buck that he had shot out of the woods. Now the son-in-law, John, hunts way, way back in the mountains. John was there to get my buddy Bill to help him. Now Bill has had a couple of heart attacks and really isn't going to be much help, so I offered to go so Bill wouldn't hurt himself further. <clears throat> John insisted that I take my rifle because it's a pretty big area. 
and if there was going to be a shot, it would be a long one. So I drove home, grabbed my 270, and Bill came up shortly after to pick me up. Once we'd made it to where we were going to walk in, John led the way. I kind of kept an eye on Bill, but Bill was doing really good at keeping up. We were walking down a logging road, so it was pretty easy walking. We'd gone about a mile when John had stopped to glass a little, and I asked him, how much further? And he said, well, we're about halfway. I said, what? And then he repeated halfway. Wow, I've ventured back in before, but not that far. And after about another mile, we finally got to where we were going to go right off the road and uphill slightly. We'd gone about 100 yards or so to the top, where it was clear-cutted, and most of the standing trees were white oaks. The area was a bowl shape that went down away from us about 100 yards or so, and was right to left about 150 yards wide, and red brush about 18 to 24 inches tall all through it. Perfect for deer. This is starting to sound like the guy that went into real extreme detail a week ago for about an hour. <laughs> John Glass, the whole area, then proceeded down and to our right for about 70 yards. And there was his buck. John hadn't gutted the deer yet, so I gave my rifle to Bill, and he sat down on a stump to watch for deer. And I took my backpack off, and I grabbed my gloves, and I gave them to John so he wouldn't get blood all over him while gutting the deer. I was facing up the hill while I was holding a leg for John. I looked over, and he was staring at the same spot for a very long time. I went to my backpack to grab my knife because I wanted to cut the tarsal glands off the buck. All right, you know what? We got to get to this, man. <clears throat> I wanted to cut the tarsal glands off the buck because I used the percent when I'm archery hunting. When I looked over at Bill again, he was still staring at the same spot. Just as I was thinking, what is he staring at? He looked to his left. I looked down where he had been staring, and there was a huge pine tree at the bottom of the bowl, and it stuck out like a sore thumb. Now, as soon as my eyes hit the tree, its head and half its chest peeked from behind the tree. It was huge. If I had to guess on how big it was, I would say its head was probably 24 inches at least. And I only saw half of his chest, but I would guess at least four feet across his shoulders and between eight to nine feet tall. I only saw it for three to four seconds, but there was absolutely no doubt about what I just saw. After I went behind, back behind the trees, I looked over at Bill, and he was still looking to the left. Now, I couldn't believe this part, but I felt no fear, and I did not feel threatened. While John was finishing up, I was talking to him and acting like I was looking at him, but I was watching the tree, and I never saw it leave, so I wasn't sure if it was still there. Now I'm thinking that it was there to get John's deer, and we interrupted him. And from the time John shot the deer and the time it took us to get there, it was about four hours. I helped John get the deer to the logging road, and he took off with it, and Bill and I slowly walked out. I hadn't said anything to Bill and John about what I saw, mainly because I didn't feel threatened and I didn't want to think I was nuts, but I know exactly what I'd seen. I work with Bill's wife and the next day, I had asked her if Bill had said anything about seeing anything that day and she said that he hadn't said anything, but was acting strange. And I told her what had happened to me, so, and she said that I should ask him if he saw something. Bill's the kind of person who wouldn't say anything because he wouldn't want you to call him a liar. I got a hold of Bill and asked him if he wanted to go to breakfast that next day. I had off, and he said, yeah. After I picked him up to go to breakfast, I started to ask him if he had seen anything strange that day. We helped John, and he said no. Then he asked, why do you ask? And I said that you were staring down toward that pine tree for a long time. I was wondering what you were looking at. Bill said that he saw something big in the brush to the left of the tree, but it was way too big to be a deer, so he just kind of blew it off as nothing. Then I proceeded to tell him what I saw, and he looked at me like he wasn't sure what to think, but I said, I guess you saw what you saw, and just left it at that. I've never gone back to that area since, but I believe I'd like to, just to see if we could hear anything going on. I do want to leave you with this, Steve. Make of it what you will, but when I started scouting and hunting up at that camp, the first thing I would say out loud was, 
I know you're there. I'd love to see you, but I don't want to feel terrified. And when I had my sighting, I did not feel threatened at all. Now, I'm pretty sure that they're in certain areas at certain times of the year. And who knows if it may have been the same one that was over in the area of camp. I don't know. I feel blessed that my experience happened the way it happened. And that's my story. Thanks for all that you do for all of us. We really couldn't have found a better person or personality to do what it is you do. Your personality is perfect in my mind, and I really feel a connection with you when I hear you talk. You're safe out there, buddy, and I do agree with you about if you tell them that you are not there to harm them, and for them to leave you alone, they will. Thanks again, Steve. Okay, man, thanks for that email. It's a long one. I'm not quite awake yet, and I was probably losing my patience there. There is, there is the photo of their what they thought that might be a print. And there's also another man inducted into the club and no return, right? Once you see them, once you know, you know, and there's no way getting out of it. Now, we get a lot of, I've got a, I get a lot of uh, emails with photos with footprints that look similar to that. And, and that track for me as being a professional hunter, um, I don't think that's a track. And I'll tell you why, because there is no, the whole ground's covered in pine needles, right? The whole ground is covered in pine needles. But there's no pine needles where that track is. So, if a track stomped on there, it would be the same amount of pine needles as on the side, straight across. So I'm thinking that's probably where the deer were scraping. And possibly, possibly, I don't know, I wasn't there. But I'm just telling you what I see and what I know about tracks. A lot of people send in photos of tracks where the ground is... The, the leaves and the pine needles are missing in that shape. And that's not what a track does. That's what scraping does. Or that's what a rock will do when a rock's moved over. Right? Anyway, moving along. Appreciate you sending that email in, man. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your time. And I do agree as well. You say out loud, leave me alone. They, they tend to, for the most part... But not completely, right? Obviously, we all know this with me. All right. What else do we got here? Who else? Oops. Hold on a second, you guys. Side note. You know, I'm learning as I go with a lot of this tech stuff. Um, of course, after I sent, after I recorded and loaded the, the Zoom meeting I had with Darren... And I could see that it wasn't that quality. Like when Nina and I did it, it was perfect, clear quality. And then uh, I'm looking like, so I Googled on Zoom, how do you make your Zoom video perfect quality? And I said, oh, well, you uh, there's a setting on the below left of the screen that says just switch it to HD or something. And I'm like, shit, are you serious? This day and age, they don't just make it automatically perfectly clear. You know what I mean? It's been fr that's been a frustrating thing for me lately because of this new computer, new editing program. And it will automatically go to 360p unless I manually set it to almost every time, but not every time. So that's been frustrating me lately. So that's why the Zoom thing, it's like, holy crap, got me again, really? But it won't get me again now. Anyway, this is titled Morning Encounter. Hey, Steve, you can, you can call me Mountain Moose. Had two encounters over the years. Like you, I do not look for these things, nor care what people think. I've hiked the Appalachian Trail a few times and the Pacific Coast Trail. I've been hunting and fishing my whole life. I've done a fair bit of trapping. In 1989, August, on the AT in the White Mountains of Vermont, I wandered off the trail for water about a mile. I went to a small pond I'd been to years before, knowing it's a good place to camp and catch some dinner. I got there, set up my bivy sack, tied between two trees, and had a good view of the pond and its creek exiting it. It was a hot day, and I got my camp set up and hit the creek to refill my water, clean up, and then try to catch a fish or two. And all went well, and caught two nice bullheads, made some dinner. I cleaned the fish on the edge of the creek and left the remains there. And after eating, I watched the beavers and a few whitetail around the pond. Almost dark, I climbed to my bivy and watched the deer leaving, just the screen shut, being no rain in sight. 
I was, a set, I was set up about 10 feet above the pond, and the exit and creek was a calm noise to put me to sleep. And in the morning, I was thinking of getting up, and the sun was soon to come up. Then, over the noise of the creek, I heard some rocks being, like, kicked around, but it wasn't light enough to see. Thinking bear, raccoon, etc., I laid there, and the sounds continued. A few minutes went by, and I looked towards the sounds and was shocked. About a hundred feet to the creek was a big, hairy, brown thing. Not a black bear, not a deer. So I watched, and this thing stood up and made its way to the pond. It was massive, and about eight feet or, or eight feet or so. And as the light got brighter, its hair was long, and I could clearly see it. I laid there in awe as this thing walked to the pond and was pulling up cattails and eating the root ball. At this time, it was maybe 80 feet from me, and I was above it in my camp bivy. I had a camera, but it was in my pack, hanging in a tree behind, sorry, <clears throat> hanging in a tree, being my food and etc. was in it. It was definitely male, and its legs and muscle tone was immense. Long brown hair with a section at the back that was much darker, but not black. It never knew I was there, and it had a very bad stench as the breeze was blowing towards me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I watched it go around the pond and out of sight. I lay there for about 30 minutes, then got out of my bivy, and I couldn't see it anymore. I packed up my stuff, knowing that I had about a six-mile hike to a road, and it would take me down, take me to town where I'd pick up a supply drop at the post office. I got to the AT and headed to the road, and when I got to the road, there was a small pull-off, and there sat a game warden in his truck. We talked for a few minutes, and he offered me a ride to town and back, so I accepted, and during a ride, we talked hiking, hunting, etc., and he asked if I was hungry, and we stopped at a small diner, and then made our way back to the trail. His name was Jim, and had 28 years as a warden in that area. As we got to the AT, he looked at me and said, For your information, there are things out here you must be aware of. And I said, What? A tall, brown, man-like thing? And he grinned and asked if I had seen him. And I said, Yes. And it was a he, and it was about eight feet tall, all brown, with a slightly darker patch around his shoulder and head on his left side. He giggled and said, where'd you see him? I told him I pointed it out on my map, and he asked me about the size again, and I explained it was a guess being I was above it, looking down. And he said, well, it's him. And he had seen him a few times, and it was over eight feet. This conversation was unique, and we traded addresses and phone numbers. I talked to him when I got home after getting, after getting to Mount Kata, Katadin, K-A-T-A-H-D-I-N, Katadin, and taking a plane home to Georgia. Over the next years, we did the Christmas card thing and talked on the phone. And after he retired, he said he's seen more than just that one. They're real, as we know. And as Jim said, he never reported his sightings, was just happy to go to retirement. My other experience was in the Northeast PA as a kid, but it was dark and I couldn't see it. But the next day I went back to the area and found some prints and a clear path where it ran through the Mount Laurel and through a low land marsh area. What to think? It doesn't quite matter after I closed clear sighting while hiking. They exist. Not much else to say. For your information, I got a nice wagtail this year, and here's the picture. I can say I watch and have subbed to all your channels for years now. I'm sorry it's long, but it is what it is. Be safe. And I enjoy others' encounters. Crazy world out there these days. I just may do the PCT again. I'm getting old, lol. Read this if you want, doesn't matter to me. Being a member long before the club began. Mountain Moose. All right, man. That's a frickin' beauty buck. I'm gonna share it for all the uh, hunt enthusiasts out there. And if you don't like hunting, well, look away. There you go, that is a hammer white tail buck. Congrats, beauty. Beauty, beauty, beauty deer. I think that's a, it's about as good as they get, heavy.
old and awesome, awesome buck. Wait till deer. Out of all the deer, I've ate what? Four types of deer, red deer, white-tailed deer, mule deer, and black-tailed deer. And out of all the deer species, white-tail is by far my favorite to eat. And I don't shoot them that often because I don't live near them. But anyway, now, question to you, sir, would be if, is the game warden still alive? And would you possibly, possibly, email him, text him, or whatever you do, if he's still with us, you guys are still in touch, maybe throw him, throw him, uh, this video link maybe, and see if he would possibly, especially since he's retired, would he possibly, maybe, generously, email us. Email the people through me and share what he has seen, what he knows, what the attitude from his employer was about the topic, how many people he may have heard report that to him during his career, and if he had any um, abnormal things accompany his sightings, you know, the typical um, sighting patterns that the, mo the majority of the big names didn't want to talk about publicly, if he's ever noticed any of those, if he had anything threatening or terrifying happen to him, everything and anything, right? That'd be really, really, really cool if we could hear from the retired game warden and what he knows as well. There you go, you guys. The bivvies, right? The hammocks. I cringe every time I, I picture that for myself. I just cringe. It just creeps me out. The thought of me sitting in one of those suckers off the ground here in British Columbia anyway. Don't need to be clotheslined by a moose. I don't need to be clotheslined by an elk <laughs> or grabbed by a grizzly bear or worse. Now, what else? Side note, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and for all you who may be interested in this, and he owns a shooting business. Kind of like, you know, if you ever go to Las Vegas and they got the gun store and anybody can go in there in a safe, a safe place atmosphere and shoot guns. And he's always been a, uh, a gun fanatic, friend of mine. He's also, actually unrelated, but coincidentally, he's had a face-to-face -face encounter as well. He doesn't like talking about it. <clears throat> Anyways, ammunition is very, very hard to come by today. Just is. If you own, I have a 300 short mag rifle. It's my favorite go-to. I've got, I got very limited amounts of uh, ammo left for it, and you just can't find it. And I was texting him last night. I was, I go, what's going on with the uh, ammunition scenario? Because he buys. He buys bulk powder. He's got these very expensive machines that clean brass and, and twirl them around and put them all in the things automatically and they fills, fills them up with the powder because their successful business, Whistler, Whistler Shooting, uh, they go through a lot of rounds. A lot of, there's millions of tourists go to Whistler, British Columbia, and they, uh, so he gets a lot of customers, they have a lot of fun, has a lot of guns, and they shoot them responsibly and safely and it's fun. Anyways. He said that he has X amount of powder left, but you can't get it anymore. I'm like, what? Like, when do you think you might be able to get more? And he goes, I don't know. He says, maybe never. We're not sure. But he's got enough to last in the next year, about a year or so, and that's it. And uh, he said, I go, is there any ammunition available anywhere else? Because I'm not a gun guy, obviously. I shoot my gun two or three times to make sure it's still on, and then I go hunting. It's just a tool for me. I'm not into shooting. And uh, he said, if you find some, grab it. So you can still get lots of shotgun ammo, and because they don't normally use shotguns for war. And he's blaming, his, apparently it's due to all of the wars going on on the planet today is why you cannot get ammunition. So, what I'm saying is, if you got some, you better hold on to it and hoard it. You better hold on to it and hoard it. It's the word direct from... A friend of mine who's professionally involved with shooting. So I went online last night, of course, and I could not find anything for any of the rifles I got. Although I do have a lot <laughs> for some other rifles. Somewhere, allegedly. Well, there you go. You got it. Hold on to it. Here's another email. This is titled, Cabin Slapping. Not one of my favorite experiences that I've lived through. Hi, Steve. I noticed quite a few stories being added about cabin slaps. 
This may be an answer to something that happened to a friend and I back in 1989. We were four high school friends that spent two weeks of our summer holidays at a friend's family cabin located 10 kilometers outside of town on the seashore. Our nights were late with drinking and playing cards. It was a great summer. And this cabin has always given me the heebie-jeebies. And when going outside to relieve ourselves, the common phrase was, we always piss with their back to the wall. It seemed like the trees had eyes. One day in particular, two of the four of us decided to go back to town to get supplies and a shower. One of the guys' dad taught summer school in a neighboring community, and they decided to walk to the highway and to hitch a ride with him on his way home. He would have passed by at 4.30 p.m. The other friend and myself decided this was a great chance to catch some much-needed Z's. There were two couches that met in the corner of the cabin, with large windows above both. We crouched on the couches with our feet meeting in the corner, to give you reference. We soon found a deep sleep, and without warning, there was a massive slap on the corner of the cabin where our feet met. We both sat straight up and looked at each other. My, daddy, my buddy didn't miss a beat, grabbed the axe by the fireplace and ran outside, only to find that there was no one outside. In such a short moment, there would not be enough time for someone to sprint to the tree line. We even checked under the cabin, hoping to find a friend hiding to scare us, and there was nothing. The cabin had a wraparound deck, and to come to think of it, I didn't hear anyone scurrying off, off of the, scurrying on the lumber. We were stumped. What could it have been? A sonic boom, an earthquake, etc.? I recall there being one massive cabin shaking slap. The thing I remember most vividly is the way those two large windows vibrated and the sound they made, much like you recounted about your stovepipe, sound you recently shared. I have one problem with all this, and that is, I'm on the island of Newfoundland. And as far as I know, we have never had a sighting here. Go figure. The other two guys were dropped off to the cabin shortly after with fresh supplies, so they had nothing to do with it. And your similar stories do add a plausible explanation. P.S. Please share any photos or videos you may receive. It helps others that have not seen anything but have had other experiences. Something huge yelled at me while refueling my truck just north of high level in June of 2000, and that still affects me to this day. Cheers. High level, that's Alberta. Northern Alberta. Yeah, well, I do have video. I do have video, and everybody I showed so far says it would more than likely blow the Patterson film out of the water, but there's nothing I can do about it because I have respect for every single person out there who asks me to have respect for them, and I can't break that. All right, so maybe I'll contact the original person who sent that to me, and I'll see what the status is on that, if it's safe to share or not. I don't think it is, because I think if it was safe to share, you would be all over the frickin' internet right now, for sure. But I do share what people ask me to share, all right? It's just when somebody says don't share and they trust me, okay, man, I got gotcha. you. He's the second I screw one person. I'm done, if I did. I said, we were talking about that the other day. We were talking about fishing the other day with a friend of mine. And they said, oh, so-and-so said they were over here and they were knocking the hell out of the fish. And I'm like, yeah, well, the guy's a chronic bullshitter, so it's unfortunate. You know what I mean? Like, for me, as soon as I see somebody bullshitting once, it doesn't matter. I barely, I'll listen to them talk, but I don't rarely ever listen anymore. I just don't. You know what I mean? You'll never cry wolf thing, right? That's the way it is. So... I just don't. I don't disrespect people. And it's not hard either. It's easy. It's easy to have respect for everyone, for me. But anyway, uh, another side note. So yesterday, a friend of mine who grew up on Vancouver Island here doing all the... He's a friend of mine who sat on the porch in that remote cabin with me a couple years ago at his cabin. We talked about this topic and what he had seen over the years. That friend of mine. He's also a taxidermist. And I had a bunch of stuff in the freezer... I'm not, I'm not a big animal mounting dude. I like having the memories, you know, I'll keep these parts and have the memories on the wall. That's all they are, even though they're, so a lot of these animals are massive animals. They're just a memory in the end. But I had a handful stacking up and I decided to uh, 
to drop them up a handful of items to get done, including that monster frickin' bear that I got with my bow this year. Gonna show her once it turned into a rug, as well as all the meat was harvested and 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 being utilized too. Anyways, I'm babbling, aren't I? So I had to go meet him in Nanaimo, because he's here for a family thing. And right away they dragged me into the house, his brother's place, and his nephew was there, and the four of us sat down, and right away he says, Tell them about uh tell them about what you see. And I'm like, really? Because I don't normally, I just don't bring it up to people I don't know. I just don't talk about it. I'm like, all right, you guys want to hear about it? I'll tell you. Turns out, and why I'm sharing this is because I always urge all of you to look people square in the eye, talk to them honestly. People you may come across who work in the outdoors, possibly, right? Anybody, hunters, fishermen, loggers, whatever. I just ask them if they've heard or seen anything know of anything and it's so common and that's what i'm trying to say is it is so freaking common these truths that if if you haven't had an experience yourself chances are you probably know somebody who has that's how common this is and it's an amazing amazing effort to keep this topic seen as a joke isn't it when it's this common anyway sorry for babbling I'm trying to get to the point i'm trying to make so uh his young nephew, who also is a builder in the small coastal village where I keep my boat, he says, yeah, well, I, I know a logger. I was telling him about this other guy I know who uh, didn't believe in these things. Hardcore hunter, seen one, and he's still messed up today and won't go in the woods. And as soon as I said that, the young fellow across from me cracks open and says, yeah, I met a guy, same deal. I'm like, huh? Who? Logger. Said he thought it was a bear staring at him, and then he realized it wasn't a bear. And he said he won't go in the woods anymore. He's done. He's messed right up. I'm like, no way, whereabouts? He said, Banfield. There you go. Remember the ladies? The conversation I had with the ladies the other day as well. They seen uh, seen these beings on the Banfield Road. And my neighbor here, who owns a big a large construction business, he told me that one of his employees seen one jumping down from the high side of the road at what we call Internet Hill. It's only about what is that? seven kilometers up the main road or something and they had a reddish brown one came right off the rock face on the left down on the road and over the edge i think it was broad daylight too anyway there you go just saying i went and sat down with four guys and one of them had a story just like that direct from the source boom bit of a battle to get that out anyway i'm gonna get i'm gonna get moving i got a lot to do got a lot to do and as soon as I get caught up, it's funny, just so many things I gotta get done. Sarah's surgery, she's gonna be fine. It's not anything overly serious. It'd be uh, uncomfortable for her. But uh, this is a bunch of things we gotta get done before that day <clears throat> so we can help her out while she heals. Now, uh, share my story at howithunt.com. And if you want to, do the Zoom video thing with me and have a conversation with me. Email me and let me know too. But I do have a long list of people I've got to contact to see if they want to come on here and speak with me. And we'll throw some shit back and forth and get some questions answered. All right. So that's share my story at howtohunt.com. And I think now there is two, four, five, five significant videos in the membership only department on this page there's still a handful of people sniveling and whining and crying saying you greedy bastard now you're charging people to watch the channel no i'm not we're generating funds to help hungry children okay and there's still free content coming to this channel every single day so please stop sniveling okay i'll be back tomorrow